Hello and welcome to the Joe Maggs Show. I'm Joe Maggs, Editor-in-Chief of The High Screen. We're recording on Wednesday night, November 12th. We're going to run this Thursday morning. Uh, talking with Cole Frederick today. Haven't talked to him in a while. Needed to get him on the pod. A lot going on in college football with the updated college football playoff rankings. Uh, definitely some controversial moves. You got Oregon and Florida State flip-flopping. TCU, Baylor, Alabama, Auburn, and Ole Miss at the bottom of the top 10 there. So a lot to talk about. And then Cole and I, we're going to talk about the NBA because he and I have been meaning to chat about it. Obviously, a very busy start to the season. Uh, So we hope you enjoy, and thank you for supporting the high screen. Here with the Joe Mag Show on the line, Cole Frederick. Cole, uh, a big, big uh, last few weeks in sports in general, and particularly in college football. You and I haven't had a chance to, to talk in a long time, man. It's just been kind of tweeting back and forth and uh, following through our, our uh, different columns. Uh, just crazy time in sports right now, man. Yeah, to me, it's, it's the best time in the... It's the best time of the year for sports because you you got college football, you got the NFL on the weekends, and then you got the NBA and college basketball is about to start start up here in, uh, in the next week or so. So yeah, the best time of the year easily for sports because there's something going on every single night. Every so it's really enjoyable. Night, every single night, man. I uh, I know what that grinds like for you between schoolwork, regular work, and then obviously keeping yeah. up with sports and writing. Uh, <laughs> Not the easiest thing. <laughs> no, but I, I enjoy it. Uh, the, the sports makes up for the school part. So definitely, definitely. And I'm always envious, man. I feel like every time, every time I talk with Cole on like a Saturday, uh, you know, it's like, hey, man, you know, you watching the games, and he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm here. I feel like you're, all, you're always in an SEC stadium somewhere, which is uh, definitely yeah. Right. Uh, I'm not planning on going. I may, I may be going to the Iron Bowl in a couple of weeks, but I've had the I've had the good fortune of seeing some. I saw the Auburn Ole Miss game a couple of weeks ago, um, which was a phenomenal game and, and heartbreaking at the end for Ole Miss. But uh, Auburn South Carolina, which is really exciting, and um, so yeah, I've, I've seen some good ones this year. You you definitely, definitely. have. You definitely have. Uh, big news right now. Obviously, you know this is going to go up on a Thursday. Uh, college football playoff top ten. Uh, every week, you know, the rankings that they come out with, it's going to be, there's going to be some controversy. There's definitely going to be a lot of question marks. This is the first time we've ever had these these conversations before. Uh, obviously, a brand new playoff system uh, debuting this year. Uh, let's talk about the top 10. So it comes out, we've got Mississippi State up top, undefeated. Uh, for how long, obviously, uh, we're going to have to stay tuned. Uh, at number two, Oregon. Number three, Florida State. And number four, TCU. So that would be the top four playoff teams if the season ended right now. Uh, Cole, what were you, what were your first thoughts when you saw that top four? Uh, really surprised at Oregon at number two. I don't disagree with it, but I was really surprised that they um, decided to move Oregon with one loss in front of Florida State, you know, the defending national champion who was undefeated. I'm surprised they flipped those around. But like I said, I don't disagree with it. I think Oregon's better right now. They have a better resume to date. They just have that one, one loss by their name. But um, yeah, F- Florida State. You look, you look at who they played. Their best win still over Notre Dame, and we found out last Saturday, Notre Dame, not as good as we thought they were. So yeah, I really have no problem with that. And I, I think part of that may be projecting the way the season will finish too, because there's a good chance that Oregon's going to finish the regular. season. He's an 11-1. They only play Colorado and Oregon State the rest of the year, and then they'll likely play Arizona State in the Pac-12 title game. So there's a pretty good chance that the Ducks are finishing 12-1, and and they're going to be in that spot anyway. So really didn't have a problem with that, and I definitely didn't have a problem with TCU at number four because, I mean, right now their resume is better than Alabama's, and I just think they're a more complete team as it stands. Uh, the only 
problem with that ranking is if TCU and Baylor both finish 11 and 1 because if if that's the case you have to flip those two around because they beat them head to head so right I mean we're going to talk about TCU in a, in a second because that's I, I think that in a lot of ways is probably the most controversial ranking but you bring up a good point with Oregon and Florida State Oregon jumping over the Seminoles uh, I don't want to over romanticize the playoff system but I think I speak for a lot of people who always wanted to love college football that much more, but were so hesitant because the BCS system turned so many people off. It, it certainly turned me off at times. Right. Uh, and so throughout the his, history of the BCS system, I don't think this would have ever happened. You know, if, if Florida State's the undefeated team from a major conference, they stay exactly where they are in the BCS poll until a loss moves them down. It, it, there was something robotic about it. And in this playoff ranking if this is a precedent move if teams can move up and down without necessarily losing games i think i think we could have something here where it's closer to a a traditional power ranking an actual thermometer of of how the teams are playing and that makes me feel really good about this system because i think you and i we agree i think in general people agree Oregon's playing better football than Florida State in a vacuum. Florida State is playing lesser competition. They're certainly in a weaker conference, uh, although the Pac-12 can be laughable at times on uh, the defensive end of things. But uh, <laughs> but in general, you know, Florida State, they're playing weaker teams, and they have also looked pretty vulnerable at times for a team that's, you know, coming off a national championship run and, you know, has an All-American quarterback. So I, I really dig this ranking, and I think it could be a, a good precedent moving forward. Well, they're actually basing on who who's the best team right now. And resumes have a lot to do with that, too. And I think that also values strength of schedule. And I was I was worried about that because I was thinking that if Michigan State would have beaten Ohio State and finished the season 11-1, and one, their, their one loss would have been at Oregon. And somebody brought up the point, I can't remember who it was, that if, if Michigan State would have scheduled somebody like Akron instead of Oregon and, and finished the season 12-0, and 0, would the perception of that team change just based off scheduling? Because I want teams to play the toughest schedule possible. Because, uh, and part of that is just because I, I grew up rooting for an SEC team, and so the, the, those SEC teams, for the most part, every week are playing a tough schedule. I, I just like seeing that good out-of-conference game. So I don't want – I'm glad the committee is rewarding teams for scheduling tough games out-of-conference because that matters. And, and um, so, so that was really important to me. But, I, I mean, if you've watched Oregon play and you've watched Florida State play, to this point, Oregon is the better team, and, and they've acknowledged that. And that, that makes, makes me excited for the future, not just this year, but for future rankings, you know, the next few years. Now, Cole, you wrote a hilarious piece for the high screen, really, really good satire of the controversy that was building up about SEC ESPN conspiracy theory and the idea that the media, particularly you know ESPN, was trying to push SEC contenders into the spotlight and into the playoff system. Uh, there couldn't be a more seismic shift in that philosophy than what we just saw in the college playoff rankings. Because not only do you have Oregon and Florida State uh, at two and three, you got TCU now at four. And Baylor sneaking up the rankings at seven, and you know, granted, it's going to be either or. Uh, but you got Alabama coming off one of the biggest wins of any you know any teams had all year. You know, them beating LSU, and they stay right where they are at five. And that is not one of the you know, that's outside the top four. Uh, so, <laughs> what do you make of that? Do you think that's the college football uh, committee? Uh, trying to send a message, or do you think they they purely think TCU is better than Alabama, or, or or what do you make of that? Okay, so the eye test and the committees use that some as a way to gauge how, how to rank teams. The eye test for TCU and Alabama, it's about the same. If you watch them play, you know you've seen flashes of brilliance from each team. Uh, they, they obviously have weaknesses, as does every team, but they're really really close. And if, but if you look at their resumes, TCU's is better to this point than Alabama's and Alabama's win at LSU was was Alabama's best win of the season but I don't think that was as 
great of a win as some people might think because LSU is good, but they're not great. They're a three-loss team that's – they're an underdog at Arkansas this week, and Arkansas has lost 16 straight SEC games. Well, Cole, so for, the record, about- for the record, the, I think the the game is valued up because of Death Valley. I mean, I, I you and I talked about this at, at length. The, the Death Valley factor is huge in that. It is. It's the toughest place to play in college football, so I'm not going to take anything away from that. And Alabama found a way to win, and at this point in the season, that's the most important thing. But – uh, you know, four or five weeks ago, I watched Mississippi State go into Death Valley, and they dominated that game. They were up 34 to 10 in the fourth quarter. The final score was closer than the game really was. But I watched Mississippi State dominate that team in the same stadium. I know it's a tough place to play, but I think what TCU did to Kansas State, albeit it was a home game for them, to me that was more impressive. They put it on Kansas State. It was a three touchdown game, and it seemed a lot worse than that. So. Like I said, Alabama has a chance to speak against Mississippi State. You know, Alabama controls its own destiny. They beat Mississippi State this week, and they beat Auburn and win the SEC title during the playoff. There's no debate about it. So, you know, Alabama fans should have no concern about what the rankings are right now because they can they can take care of it themselves. That they can. That they can. Uh, you pass over Mississippi State's beatdown of LSU uh, like it was a magic trick. I. We can't overstate. Dak Prescott is a superhero in a football uniform, and once <laughs> once we as a country come to agree on this, then we can anoint him as some sort of higher being, and he can make all of our political decisions. Uh, no, I I think <laughs> I think Mississippi State. I mean, it's very clear they're playing the best football. Uh, but this game coming up between them and Alabama, it. It, it, it's exactly what you described. It, it kind of feels like a play-in game, which is weird for a team like Mississippi State that is playing so well that it could all unravel in one in one game. But that's the nature of the beast. Uh, I don't. I mean, you and I, you and I were tweeting about Nick Saban this weekend. Uh, not not either of our favorites, but uh, <laughs> I feel I, I, maybe it's just the Alabama thing, but. It almost feels like Mississippi State is is the underdog going into this game because it's Alabama and because it's Nick Saban. Uh, how how should we gauge this game coming up? Uh, well, Alabama has a perception because because of who they are. You know, they're just automatically going to roll over. You know, pretty much every team in the league, they're going to find a way to make the playoffs. And that's just who they are now. Um, and I, for the record, I don't dislike Nick. Saban, I think he's the best coach in college football. It's, it just so happens that I grew up rooting for the team that is Alabama's rival, and so there's there's some animosity towards that school, you know. Uh, and by the way, Nick Saban summed up Dak Prescott uh, pretty in, in a funny way the other day. He said he's basically like Tim Tebow, except that he can throw. <laughs> so that, that's pretty that's a pretty good way to describe Dak, but. To me, I was so surprised that Alabama was – they're an eight-and-a-half point favorite against Mississippi State. And I can't remember the number one team in the country this late in the year being that big of an underdog to another team. And, and a lot of that's because, you know, Alabama is who they are. And um, that's not – Vegas doesn't have a lot of respect for Mississippi State. And they lose this game. Their out-of-conference schedule was so weak that they might not be able to climb back into the picture if Alabama goes on to win the West. As, as crazy as that sounds, because they've been so good for the entire season, if they, if they lose this game, uh, that's probably it for them. So a lot riding on this game. I, you know, I feel like everybody trusts Alabama more just because they're Alabama. And, um, you know, Mississippi, that, that's, Mississippi State can win this game, though. They... They have what it takes to go into Brent Denny and pick up a, a huge road win, but you know I'm, I'm picking Alabama to win, and a lot of it's just because I've seen Alabama play under Nick Saban the last seven or eight years. So I know who they are, and I just I trust them more than I do Dan Mullen and the Bulldogs. It's going to be a great game. Uh, it, I, it's it's so it's so tough to to say you know it. Every week it seems like there's another best game of the year kind of thing, but this game 
just with everything that's riding on it, uh, it feels like it could be the first really great regular season game of the playoff system because you're taking all of that subtext into into account. You got Auburn and Ole Miss who are watching this game praying that Alabama wins, except they hate Alabama. <laughs> Uh, but they need Alabama to win so that they can keep their playoff odds alive. You got Mississippi State. If they win, they're in, and they're probably, I, I mean, unless a, you know, a couple things change. I mean, they, they would be the number one seed uh, in the playoff, and that obviously carries a ton of weight. Uh, it's going to be great. It's going to be a great game. Um, so, obviously, we cover one through five. You got Arizona State at six. We talked about Baylor at seven. Ohio State, eight. And then we got Auburn at 9, Ole Miss at 10. <laughs> uh, Cole, round out the top 10 for me. I guess I guess we could you know just start with Arizona State, but there are scenarios that aren't that out of reach for these teams to make it into the playoff. Uh, with a team like Arizona State, uh, tell me how they get in. It, is it as simple as they, 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 win, <laughs> they win all their games and, and then beat Oregon in the title game? That's absolutely it. They beat Oregon State this week. And they got Washington State, and then they close out the season at Arizona. They win those games and then play Oregon in the Pac-12 title game and win that too. You can't keep them out, even though they lost 62 to 27 to UCLA. You you can't do it. You have to you have to include them in there. But I think Arizona State's a fraud. I, I think they're I have them on upset alert this weekend against uh, Oregon State and Corvallis. But I think if even if they win this weekend, I think Arizona probably gets them at the end of the year. And, you know, if they happen to make it to the Pac-12 title game with one loss, and Oregon's going to put it on them if they play. So I, I'm not a believer in Arizona State. Um, Baylor at seven has a really good chance to run the table. They've got uh, um, Oklahoma State coming up. They've got Texas Tech on a neutral field. Those are going to be easy wins. They close out the season with Kansas State. It's in Waco. Well, Oh, that's a game they should win, even though uh, I wouldn't take Kansas State lightly because Bill Snyder's been known to pull off a few upsets. But you know, you got to feel good about Baylor's chances of winning out and finishing eleven and one. Uh, um, Ohio State at eight. That's another team that they got a few tricky games ahead. This I don't think this weekend's game at Minnesota. If they take it lightly, Minnesota can actually play a little bit, and they're a physical running team that um, could give Ohio State a little bit of trouble, but. And whoever they play for in the Big Ten title game, it's not going to be an easy game, whether it be Nebraska or Wisconsin. But I actually like the way Ohio State's playing a lot. They, uh, since that horrible loss to Virginia Tech, they've been one of the best and most consistent teams in the country. And that win at Michigan State was among the most impressive wins of the year of any team. So uh, um, for one loss teams, I think Ohio State and Baylor have pretty good chances of winning out, but. A one-loss Big Ten team, you know, I don't know exactly how much how much merit that's going to have with the playoff committee if they're up against two one-loss Big Twelve teams or a, even a two-loss SEC team. So, I I hear you on all that, and and I guess this is kind of where my question before was coming from. I don't see the I don't see the problem in. At the end of the regular season, after you know all the games have been played out, if a team like Arizona State is is the one left standing in the Pac-12 with a shot to you know get the bid for the playoff, like I think that's when you could see a second SEC team or a, even a second Big 12 team if if Baylor and TCU are still playing at such a high level. I think what I'm op- optimistic for is the college football playoff committee would make the right call in that in that situation. Because just eye test, just watching the games, I don't think Arizona State's a top four team in the country. I don't even think Ohio State is is really in play for that. I think I think TCU and Baylor are. I they they pass the eye test for me. Uh, Florida State, they come with some baggage, but this is a good team. Oregon is I think Head and shoulders, the best team in the Pac-12, uh, and, and then you look at Auburn and Ole Miss, teams that you know could very well end up with with multiple losses and, and, and sitting on the outside looking in. Uh, those teams, I think, if you just play them head to head against, if you if you put Auburn or Ole Miss against Arizona State, who wins 
you know, nine times out of 10, Auburn or Ole Miss. So I, I just, I, exactly. I'm optimistic that when this thing's all said and done, the right four teams are going to be in, regardless of, you know, the politics of, of making sure conferences are represented and whatnot. I, I, I think the worst case scenario would be a team like Arizona State get in, get annihilated in a playoff game when you got a team like Auburn or Ole Miss potentially not, um, or, you know, looking on from the sidelines and not getting a chance to play. Well, if, let me give you a situation that I've thought about repeatedly since Auburn blew the game against Texas A&M last week. If Auburn wins out and finishes 10-2, and two, so that means they would have road wins at Kansas State, Ole Miss, Georgia, and Alabama. If they finish 10-2 and two and Ohio State finishes – the twelve and one Arizona State finishes twelve and one. You know the committee is going to have a really, and they're all fighting for one spot there. Or it might actually be two by that point. But I mean, how are they going to decide? Because nobody would have a, a better resume than Auburn. You can't, you can't possibly top those four road wins. Now Auburn shot itself in the foot with that loss on Saturday, but um, I just have a feeling that if they win out, I, I think that they're going to be a team that. The community's going to have to think really hard about as to whether they put that team or they put a one-loss Ohio State team in there in that last spot. So um, now I, I, I'm not certain that Auburn can win out. They're, they get, they're going to have their hands full with uh, rested Todd Gurley this day, but it, it is something to think about, especially if you're you know a fan of one of those teams. So. Yeah, I uh, I think this is ultimately why. When this year finishes and, and we look at how successful it was, it won't take long for the football committee to up this thing to eight teams. Uh, because, Absolutely. Right. I think that's where we're ultimately going. Uh, and, if, and if the dialogue is, well, if you make it eight teams, then everyone's going to want 16. I would say, yeah, you're probably right. But I think that speaks more to the fact that we want to watch playoff. We want to watch playoffs. We want to watch you know, the best teams in any sport. Uh, but I think eight works particularly well for college football because I can tell you right now, there might not, you know, there might only be eight teams or less that I think really could be national champions. I already Correct. know that, and it's November 12th, you know, with, with a few weeks to go. I, I think eight is going to end up being the perfect number. We might just have to wait a couple of years to get there. Oh, it, it'll be eight at some point. It might be, I think this contract they have for four I'm not exactly sure, but I want to say it runs through 2024. Um, yeah, but I, if you look at who the eight teams would be, you take the ACC champion, which Florida State, the SEC champion, at this point we'll say Mississippi State. The Big 12 would be Baylor, the Big 10 would be Ohio State, and the Pac-12 would be Oregon. So then you're at large teams, you know, that, that, that's where the committee can uh, – they, they have three of them, so you can really pick up it's Alabama – or Auburn, and they're going to play each other, obviously. So one would cancel the other out. So one of those would be in there. And then um, you have your, t- your TCU and then, you know, one another wild card in there. I just think that makes too much sense for it to be eight teams. So, you know, what is it? we'll just have to wait the 14 playoff thing out. And the biggest thing for me is why, are, why weren't we doing this all along? Why, why aren't we letting humans and, like, a, a panel of 100 riders decide who – who made it instead of doing this playoff committee thing the whole time, because this is so much better than the BCS system. I, th- I think even casual observers of college football can acknowledge that too. No, I think it, it's better for the casual observer. Uh, and I, I, I don't want to tread over ground that we've already covered. Cause I think I'm pretty sure we've, we've talked about this at length on a previous pod, but I, I think this is college football finally adhering to the casual fringe fans who wanted to buy in but just didn't believe in the final product. Uh, I, I, this is great. This is great for the casual fan. You get to watch. You get to watch games all year long without thinking, "Oh, you know what? That loss. There's no way the computers will put them back into the mix." Like you get to watch right. all regular season long, and every week we're gonna get you know this update from the committee saying, "All right, hey, this is where we stand. These are the best teams," and you got you. It's not just appealing to a computer system to finish in a top two. You you really have a chance to, you know, even if you have a tough loss against a really good opponent or, hey, you know, we played one of the toughest non-conference schedules and we lost to, you know, a 
a, a great team in a different conference. But look what we did. There, there's just so many versions of, of getting the best four teams. Uh, I, it's just it's just better. It's just better. This year's been so fun. Uh, it was really, yeah. That, and I was thinking about that the other day. I, um, if in the BCS era, if Auburn would have lost to Texas A&M, they'd be done. No chance. They're out. And now. There's you no know, the chances are very slight still. There's there's still a chance for them to work their way back into the mix. So it, it, it's that case with a lot of teams because Ohio State would have no chance at the a two team BCS race. And now yeah, actually actually can we do that right now? Let's 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 pl- put our our thinking caps on. So if 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 okay. this was last year, just copy paste the entire season. Uh, obviously Mississippi State would still be in the one position, right? But yes, but Mississippi State. If they lose to Alabama, they're like they're done in the BCS, like is like a zero yes. percent chance. It, and like the reality is, they're probably not going to make the playoffs if they lose to Alabama anyway. But in the BCS system, it's it's over. Like their entire season is over. Uh, it, they go from worst to to essentially last. Uh, and who would I mean? Probably Florida State would be. Probably Florida State would be either one. They'd either still be one, or they'd be they'd be penned in at two. Uh, yeah, they'd be two. They'd be two right now in the BCS. If it'd be Mississippi State and Florida State, pretty cut and dry, with Oregon three and Alabama four. That, that's the way the four would be in the BCS. And um, the Alabama Mississippi State game on Saturday would be an elimination game for them because um, even if so, let's say in the BCS era, Alabama beats Mississippi State. But Alabama loses to Auburn, and Mississippi State still wins the SEC West. Well, even if they were the SEC champion at twelve and one, Mississippi State would be out of it because so it would be probably be somebody like Florida State and Oregon in the national title game, and no SEC team at all. As How crazy as that sounds, this is that that was what we were doing yeah. in two, like in in January two thousand fourteen. We still did that, <laughs> and it's amazing how many times. The BCS actually got it right. Like I say, got it right. They kind of lucked into it, getting the two best teams in there. But look, I'm bringing up Auburn again. But in 2004, there was a situation where there was an undefeated USC, there was an undefeated Oklahoma, and there was an undefeated Auburn. And Auburn got left out. I, and I, I don't know that Auburn was better than USC that year, but they were certainly better than Oklahoma, who lost 55 to 19 in the title game. Mm-hmm. And can you can you just imagine an undefeated SEC team getting left out of a national title in 2014? They, people would lose their minds. Yeah. So we were we, we were we were letting that decide who played for a national title. It's just it's mind boggling that we were letting that happen. Right. Like our our kids' generation will will laugh at us. They'll, they'll say things like, yeah. "Dad, how how did people were people wearing underwear on their faces?" Like. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, when we, 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 there's a 64 team playoff in 20 years, people are just going to be like, "Wait, there used to be two teams that played for it." <laughs> oh my god! Um, we mentioned Georgia before. I guess we should go back. There is a version of this season where Georgia finds a way into the playoff, right? I mean, if they come out of you know they'll come out of the SEC East, if they put up a whooping in the conference uh, championship game. They, I feel like that that could put them in the top four. Uh, do you think it's a matter of, you know, every week we we have to ask ourselves what's going on with with their best player? I mean, do you think they could make it in without him? Do you, do you think they need him on the um, It's a, it would be a long shot for Georgia to make it, even if they won the SEC. And you know, they get Gurley back on Saturday. He is back one hundred percent. And he's probably going to get 40 carries against that bad Auburn defense. Um, so if they went out, I mean, they beat Auburn, they beat Georgia Tech, and then they beat either Mississippi State or Alabama in the title game, there's a chance they make it. But when you look, look at their resume, their best win would be over in the SEC title game and over Auburn. But you look at their losses. They lost to South Carolina with Todd Gurley in the lineup. They lost to South Carolina, who might not even make a bowl game. And they lost to Florida. Um, granted, Gurley wasn't playing that game, but they were just dominated by a Florida team that's been struggling all year. So uh, Georgia's chances of making a – I think they're 16 right now. It's, it's a really long shot for them, even if they win the SEC title, which brings up another crazy scenario. Hey, the SEC might get left out of this playoff if that were to happen. 
that <laughs> that would that would I feel like ruin a lot of the good feeling about about it. <laughs> um, yeah. It, it... Yeah. No, because I, I I think in any situation where the SCC comes up empty, you'd have to really question like, all right, well. It makes sense on paper, but I thought we instituted this system so that it wasn't about the paper anymore. Um, right. I, I'm I'm going to counter your point on Georgia, which are all good points, and say Georgia might be the perfect representation of this system and how far they're willing to go as far as in, its, in their first season setting a precedent for the eye test and establishing who are the best four football teams when it comes time to, to picking them. Because... If Georgia beats Auburn and then they beat Georgia Tech, which they should, uh, and then they won a potential, you know, a, a, an SEC championship game against either Alabama or Mississippi State, that would be three wins back to back to back of very high mer- merit. Uh, and you know, you look like they lose to Florida without their best player, and the South Carolina loss seems like a million years ago at that point. Uh, so I don't know. I think Georgia's is going to be an interesting t- test study. And I think a lot of it does have to do with how everyone else in that top 10 uh, plays out. But look, if, if a bunch of teams that but are supposed have... to win out lose and Georgia ends up the kind of the, the last team standing in the SEC, I think they got to be in. Um, like I said, they, they still have a chance. It's just, it's just a really, really long shot for them. They, they have to have a lot of things go their way about, you know, a dozen things go their way for that to happen. And, uh, you know, if you're comparing two lost SEC champion Georgia versus one lost Big Ten champion Ohio State, you know, Ohio State might get the nod there because you have to, as bad as Ohio State's loss to Virginia Tech was, Georgia's loss to South Carolina, it was about the same week, and those two teams are probably going to finish with about the same record. You have to look at the overall body of work. And I don't think when losses occurred should matter. Like if you lost a team in September, you know, it's it's the same as losing the team in November. You can't help where they're scheduled. So like, th- there is a chance that Georgia could find the way in there, but they're going to have to get a lot of breaks for that to happen. All right. You, you caught me. I, I was, I was kind of making a stretch there. I was, I was uh, really, I was really uh, going for it. I don't know. I mean, we'll see. I, I, I think obviously we have to kind of take it week to week. Uh, I'm excited to see Gurley come back, though. I think, I think I'm not. Let's just put it that way. Oh yeah, yeah. You're not. You're shaking in your <laughs> boots because Gurley could be the like personification of all of your fears. Uh, <laughs> well, th- thankfully, Ty Gurley doesn't play quarterback because that's really the position that's been hurting Auburn the most the last few weeks. But yeah, just it, seeing him out there is not going to be the most pleasant sight if you're a fan of the opposing team. But he's. He's going to have a monster day, and they're going to give him the ball a lot. He, he he's still so incredible to watch. So I'm, I'm at least going to enjoy that. You can't help but enjoy that watching that player, that talented play. But I wish it was a week later when he came back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Cole, I mean, obviously a lot to look uh, forward to this weekend. While I got you, man, I mean, we haven't we haven't caught up in a while on the pod. Uh, why don't we get into a little NBA basketball? You. Uh, yeah, you know, you know, Absolutely. I've been watching. I know you've been watching. Why don't you give me, give me two or three? What, what have your highlights been so far? Um, really love watching the Warriors play. Um, to me, it's been really surprising how well they've played defensively so far. We knew they could be an offensive juggernaut with the Splash Brothers in the backcourt, but they've been really good on defense. I love anytime Thompson and Iguodala are on the floor defensively. Bo gets great at protecting the rim. I love Draymond Green. They just they have a lot of pieces. Once they get some of the chemistry issues worked out, this team has a very, very high ceiling. Um, so really big on them, even though they lost to the Spurs last night. Uh, uh, really surprised at the how, how much the Clippers have been struggling because this is a team that chemistry-wise, you'd think they'd be okay by this point. I mean, they got a lot of the same pieces. Their only real difference was adding Spencer Hall's. So I'm really surprised that they've struggled so much coming out of the gate. Um, what What are your thoughts on the Clippers so far? Well, the Clippers they have they have some big question marks, right? They they did add Spencer Hawes, who I'm a fan of. 
and I think whenever Spencer and Blake are on, they're on the floor together, the Clippers are going to score like gangbusters. Uh, Spencer yeah. Spencer spreads the floor so well as a big, and it allows Blake to, to go ham inside. Uh, I mean, this Clippers team, we've kind of been asking the same questions for a while now. Is As is, is, is great of friends as DeAndre and Blake are, are they really that good of a match for each other? Because DeAndre Jordan can't score outside of the paint. And Blake Griffin is the most dangerous forward in the league there. So you can't have two guys standing on top of each other. Although that would be a really, really frightening sight if you're the other team. If DeAndre Jordan and Blake Griffin were standing on top of each other. Uh, <laughs> yes. And I'm sure Chris Paul would find a way to make that work. Uh, no, I, I think the Clippers, it's, it's early. Blake Griffin's been battling an illness. He looked, he looked like crap the other night. Uh, oh, what game was it? Was it against? It wasn't against the Spurs. It was. It was. It was against a really good. Oh, it was against the Trailblazers. He looked like crap. He yeah, looked totally. like he could barely stand up. He was so sick. Uh, I think the Clippers will figure it out. I know some some uh, writers have been really uh, harsh on Chris Paul early on the year that he looks like he's lost a step. I think he's really good at disguising what his his energy level and his health is at this point. He's 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 pretty savvy in that regard. I think the Clippers will be in the mix at the end, particularly because OKC leaves a giant hole in the top of the West uh, if they're not going to be in the mix for a top seed this year. Uh, I think the Clippers will be there, but they have they have some question marks. I think teams are going to really score on them inside, uh, and their spacing could be better to this point. So, Well, I watched, I watched them play the Spurs the other night. It was the first time this year that I really watched them for the entire 48 48- minutes and I, I i can't put my finger on it yet what the problem is chris paul he doesn't look right um at the end of the game leonard leonard just shut him down and he picked him twice at the end to really the spurs went on a 12 0 run did a lot of spurs things at the end um which Kawhi leonard's game by the way he's he's made the leap offensively he they're starting to run plays through him now he's um Starting to score, he looks comfortable on offense. Really, I mean, you know how much I love the Spurs. Yeah. But if if he takes that next step as an offensive player, it's going to be really tough to beat them. Let me actually let me yeah, just ask you about Kawhi Leonard real quick. Uh, it's been a pretty you know big you know big dialogue this past week. You know, Kawhi Leonard didn't get the extension with San Antonio now, which means it's going to be a uh, question mark this off season. Do you agree with San Antonio's choice to leave it up to chance? Uh, you know, obviously they're figuring that they're going to have some money to play with this summer if Duncan and Ginobili end up retiring, and they're kind of it was kind of a home run move. Do you um, think- obviously, you know, I I, I wish they, there was a way we could have locked Leonard up. Uh, I just said we. I just I just pulled a Bill Simmons and said we. Um, <laughs> you're you're wearing a Spurs jersey right now. The no one can tell, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just wish that they could have found a way to do that because I, I just love Leonard's game, and we saw what happened with the Maverick. I mean, excuse me, with the Rockets and Chandler Parsons. They, they kind of did the same thing, and it didn't. It backfired on them. So, you know, I would have loved. I would have loved to have seen you know Leonard be locked up for for, for a long term, but. He said the other day that he plans on being a spur for life, so I, I, I feel like they're going to get a, a deal done at some point. If, if Duncan and Manu retire, um, I, I feel like Marc Gasol is, is destined to be a San Antonio spur, by the way. I, I feel like he's going to be there next year. And maybe that's just wishful thinking, but um, I, I, could see, I could see that marriage working out well. And I, and I think that people predicting the Spurs' demise after this year you know, might have to wait a couple more years. Uh, yeah, totally. I mean, a couple reactions to, to those points are, A, the difference between the Kawhi Leonard situation coming up and what Chandler Parsons uh, did with Dallas and Houston, Ka- Kawhi Leonard is a max level player, period, full stop. And I think, you know, you, you, can, you can poke fun at what Houston ended up getting this summer, but essentially their choice was, you know what, we made a mistake with Parsons. We we left him out there. He took a he took a very healthy offer from Dallas. We're not willing to pay a player fifteen million dollars a year that isn't a fifteen million dollar player. That was their choice, and they ended up getting right. Trevor Ariza for half. 
but there's no mixing it up. Kawhi Leonard is a max level player. He's a finals MVP. So I think no matter what happens, even if San Antonio comes up empty with other free agents or, or let's say Duncan and Ginobili want to stay for another year, so they're staying on the cap sheet, they're going to give Kawhi Leonard the max, and with bird rights, they can go over the salary cap if they need to. So there, in my opinion, there's no way Kawhi Leonard ends up on another team. It's just a matter of how does it play out. Does he, does he you know, withhold... Uh, his option to sign another offer sheet so they can go get a Gasol or, you know, I, I, I would just be throwing out make-believe names, you know, after that. But, you know, does does he wait for them to do that and then sign? Or does he sign an offer sheet and put the pressure on him? I don't know. But it, I would say I, there's a 99.9% chance he's a Spur next year. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. Um, I wanted to ask you about... Okay, what do you think the chances are that Oklahoma City misses the playoffs altogether? Give me a percentage. Ooh. Okay. All right. So let's say that let let's say Westbrook comes back in December, right? So sometime mm-hmm. in December. And let's say that you know every the, the rest of the team is relatively healthy or you know at least an average health situation for an NBA team in the middle of the season. Durant has a choice to make, I, you know, for for his career, which is, does he rush back to help OKC climb back up in the standings, or does he take all the time that he needs to make sure he is right? Because I can see it from both ways. I I think there there are already fingers starting to point at Durant in the same mold as LeBron at, at that time in his career, like Durant. You've only made one finals and you lost. Where's the ring? Where's the ring? But right. I, but I think everybody knows it wasn't Durant's first choice for them to trade James Harden. And it put the whole franchise in a in a more dire situation than they needed to be when their nucleus was four all-stars under 25 years old. Uh, right. I, think Durant, I think Durant takes his time. I think Durant takes his time. I think he comes back in January. Maybe maybe like late January, even early February. Maybe maybe he, you know, who knows? Maybe he's looking at the All Star break as a time to come back. And the reason is there is no reason for him to risk his long term health to try to rush OKC back into being some, you know, to try to get back into the mix for home court advantage in the first round. Uh, and so if that happens, how far could they fall? I mean, OKC. I tell you what, I don't think OKC. Is I don't think they're going to win fifty games in that situation. Like that, that's probably a forty-eight win team max, and that's if Durant and Westbrook like throw them over the top those last couple months. Uh, meanwhile, you got Memphis, Dallas, Portland, Houston, San Antonio, Los Angeles, Golden State. These are all teams that could win fifty-five plus games. So I, I, if you're going to put me on the spot with a percentage, I'd say. 20% that they missed the playoffs? Which is pretty high okay. considering they um, have two of the 10 best players in the world. Oh, absolutely. We're to the point already in the season where we're looking at every single Thunder win and saying, wow, they beat the Celtics tonight. That's a big win for them because they need every <laughs> single win they can get at this point. Because who knows when Westbrook and Durant, either one will be back. They, they need as many wins they can get without them on the floor because if they don't come back until Christmas Day or around then, they're, they're going to be in trouble in the wins column because there's you – know, the, Pel- the Pelicans, you know, who I love, I love Anthony Davis and that, that whole, whole team. The Suns are still good. Like you said, the Mavs, the, the Blazers, those are the teams that are going to be in that 6, 7, 8, 9 range. And I don't know. But if, if, if they're too far behind by that point – they may be in some trouble. Now, if they do get into the playoffs and Durant and Westbrook get right injury-wise, uh, whoever's the one seed is not going to want to play them in round one. Yeah, that's that's the thing that, I mean, we're not even close to that point yet, but just kind of looking ahead, there's totally a scenario where OKC and San Antonio play in round one. And yeah. that is the absolute worst scenario for the Spurs uh, because that's really the only team that they have a matchup problem with. And if OKC is healthy sitting there, it doesn't really matter if they have home court or not. They're going to give the Spurs everything they can. 
that would be a worst case scenario for them for sure. Uh, but they have to get there first. And you you bring out New Orleans. I'll even throw Phoenix in, into that discussion. There are teams yes. in the West that are really strong that simply won't be able to get into the playoffs. And whether New Orleans finishes with 40 wins or 45 wins, that's a really good team with one of already one of the five best players in the world. And those kind of teams are are a nightmare to match up against late in the year when, when the wins really matter. And I don't know. I just wouldn't be shocked if, if Anthony Davis can lead the Pellies to 48 wins, 49 wins. Who knows? I mean, the sky the, the sky's the limit for this guy. No, he, he's been sensational already. I mean, but it really, really, there's not a weakness to his game. He can shoot, rebound, pass, steal, block. He can play defense. He, he Seriously, he can do everything. And that's what makes this team so interesting and entertaining both. And I and I really think they could contend for the eighth seed this year. I picked them to do that uh, before the season. I, th- I thought that they would take Portland's place. And, um, I mean, I, I may be wrong there. I, I don't know. They might end up being the 9 or 10, kind of where Phoenix was last year. But – and plus, Monty Williams is not a great coach anyway. So yeah, that yeah. Could, that could be the reason why they don't make it. But they're they're just they're a really interesting team. They also had the disadvantage of being in the best conference in basketball. I mean, excuse me, in the best division in basketball. So yeah. I, I I feel like the twenty percent for Oklahoma City was about right. But they it's it's going to be close unless Westbrook and or Durant can make just really speedy recoveries. Two wild, crazy points to make about New Orleans. Well, one more wild and crazy than the other. I think you make a good point with Monty Williams. I don't think he's the guy long-term. This this franchise smells like a team that is going to make that... that he's gonna, they're going to bring in that second coach for Anthony Davis, and it will all, it'll all really click. It'll, it'll reshuffle the deck enough. It'll change up the philosophy enough, and then things will soar. Uh, and, I mean... You mean what Oklahoma City should have done with Scott Brooks two years ago? <laughs> what they didn't do with Scott Brooks, I think New Orleans will learn from their mistake. Uh, okay. I mean, you know, that's a whole other conversation. But, uh, <laughs> but no, because what New Orleans did, which was interesting, is they didn't build their team really young and then say, hey, we have a nucleus that will grow together. They went out and they traded first-round picks and they traded assets to bring in this, this conglomerate of players – who are already established and you're know, relatively young, but you got guys like Tyreek Evans, Eric Gordon, Drew Holiday, Omar Asik, Ryan Anderson, these guys in their mid twenties who have established roles and skills. And they said, we're going to bring Anthony Davis, all of these guys now so that when he's turning into a superstar, he already has good teammates. And it's just, it's just an interesting choice. Everyone always makes a big deal out of stacking up assets and growing as a younger team. And I think in a lot of ways, that's the smartest way to do it. But when you have Anthony Davis, I think you can afford to try something different. And I don't know if Monty Williams is the right coach for that philosophy, but I, you watch this team when they're at their, their apex and you got like Tyreek and Gordon running around, you know, filling lanes, Anthony Davis and Austin getting every rebound in sight, Drew Holiday running the pick and roll. I mean, when their ceiling is really high already, and, and they probably don't even know how to win 50 games yet. Imagine what's going to happen when they're a little bit wiser and, and you know, potentially with a, a better coach for what they're trying to do. Uh, the other thing I want to bring up, this is my wild and crazy theory. You know how Seattle gets thrown around as the next destination for one of these teams? You know, somebody's, yeah. somebody's going to change ownership and that, that team's going to get moved to Seattle. I always get into uh, to arguments with my friends who are more fringe NBA fans uh, about the geography of the league and how there's an absolute imbalance and there are teams that are just in the wrong conference geographically. And the most flagrant example is New Orleans. New Orleans is not on the western side of this country. It is, it is in the southeast no. period, right? And I think there's a version of the NBA in the next couple of years where a team gets moved to Seattle and to reshuffle the deck, like, you know, if it's an Eastern team that moves to Seattle, New Orleans comes over to the East. And if Anthony Davis plays in the Eastern Conference, I I don't even, like, 
I don't even know what that will be like because it'll be around the same time Anthony Davis is really ascending into his next gear. Like, could an Anthony Davis team in the East win 65 games? That I feel like that's in play. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Now, that's an interesting point. I hadn't thought of that. Last year, I was kind of thinking about that when I was thinking, okay, if Memphis was in the East, and they're, they're like, New Orleans, they're kind of close to being like Memphis is. I, it's an hour away from where I live now in Oxford. Memphis is not a West Coast team. No. Okay, they're not. They're not a team that belongs in the West Division either. And I thought that if Memphis was in the East last year, they would have won the conference. They'd have beaten Miami if they'd have played them. Absolutely, and they absolutely. So that, would. They, they, you can make a case for them out of the last four years, even with LeBron in Miami, that Memphis have won the East twice in the last four years. Had they been over there and. The same the same thing for New Orleans in the future that yeah if let's if Charlotte moves to Seattle or Milwaukee moves to Seattle then they're definitely a candidate to move over to the East and they would end up dominating. I feel like that I I don't want to I don't want to go out on a limb and say like that's already in Adam Silver's mind but it, it kind of just makes sense right you you have this chemical imbalance where one conference is is it's like diabolical how imbalanced the league is and. If you have a chance to just very naturally move one of the best players in the sport to the other side, uh, you'd have LeBron and Anthony Davis on one side. You'd have the West, you know, the the Spurs carry over plus Durant and Westbrook plus Blake and Chris. I it just I think it makes sense for the for the league. And man, I would just love to see Anthony Davis ripping apart the the, the teams in the East every night. Uh, well, I think at some point, I don't, I don't know when, but at some point we might see Anthony Davis, LeBron, and Kevin Durant all on the East within the next three to four years. I think that you know that could be in play, where it'd be kind of the, the balance of power in the NBA shifts from the West to the East, just because two players move over. Yeah, well, I mean that that's something that's been coming up as free agency becomes a much bigger deal in the NBA than trades. Uh, you know, it comes up like, why would a star player in the prime of their career move to the West? I mean, if you're already on a Western team, that's one thing. But if you're if you're on an Eastern team, why would you elect to go play in the West when there's just no natural path to the top of the conference? That came up with Chris Bosh, right? Chris Bosh, why would you go right. to a brand new team in Houston that there's no guarantee they'll make it out of the first round? Uh, when you can stay exactly where you are in Miami, you could be the best player on your team. Miami might end up winning a playoff series or two this year because they actually look pretty good. Uh, yeah, everyone, that's, that is not a secret, is that the East is wide open every year now. And uh, if you're a star player like Durant, uh, that Washington Wizards gig is looking pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of the the East. Do you think? Do you think the East is wide open this year? Do you, Do you think there's more than two teams that can win the East, or do you think it's strictly going to be Cleveland and Chicago in the end? Well, everybody and their mom predicted Chicago and Cleveland as the top two teams in some order. Um, right. But I actually was just talking with uh, with a new Twitter contact online today uh, about the Toronto Raptors, and you know, I had written about Toronto a couple weeks back. He's working on something for this week, and we just started talking back and forth about how good they look. And you know, they're they're an interesting team, right? Because they're they're in Toronto, so they're you know they have that goofy Canadian thing working against them. They have Drake as their ambassador, which both works <laughs> it works for and against them. Uh, yes, but from a basketball perspective, I mean, they're playing better basketball than Cleveland, period, and. I think Chicago at times has looked really good, and then they have some other things that are bothersome. Like they're the worst defensive rebounding team in basketball for some reason, uh, you know, which will probably change swiftly. But I think Toronto, Toronto playing great basketball isn't a fluke. It's a carryover from last year when they were the second best offense in the conference. And you look at Washington; they've made huge strides. I'm I'm a big believer in Charlotte. I think Charlotte has a nice roster. I think they're going to give somebody a handful in the playoffs if they're healthy. Uh, so yeah, I, yeah. I think the the number of teams that could win multiple playoff series this year in the East is probably closer to six or seven than it is two or three. Uh, and I think particularly the way Cleveland's come out of the gate, you know, this isn't going to be 
you know, some uh, some quick fix where you know by December they're they're winning you know eighty percent of their games or something. I mean, they're they're gonna have they're gonna have some problems to address, uh, particularly in completing this roster and getting some depth inside. And and there are teams in this conference that will take advantage of that if they don't you know, fix those flaws. So uh, I think the East will be fun as hell because I really think come playoff time anybody could win. It's kind of like the West, just like a lesser <laughs> a lesser version of the West. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. I mean. Um, the Cleveland issue is it, like a lot of it's chemistry stuff that they will work out just by nature of playing 82 games together. So by the, I'm not worried about them. The only the only part of that team I'm kind of concerned about is your boy Dion Waiters, the Syracuse Orange, you know, phenom. Um, he's the only problem I see with Cleveland just because of his. He, when he gets in the game, he's going to shoot it when he gets the ball. He's he's like a, he's not quite to J.R. Smith level yet, but he's getting there. See, um, but see, so, honestly, so, my, I have a bigger problem with Kyrie. I think I think Kyrie uh, is a bigger obstacle for this team because I don't think yeah, because he's not a, he, yeah, because I don't he, think Dion could ever be J.R. Smith as far as when you play with LeBron James, you're not allowed to become J.R. Smith. Like, Dion would get benched before. That's true. That, that's a that. good point. And I think that um, with, with Kyrie, he, he's the type of player that, you know, last two minutes of the game, he wants the ball. And so does Kevin Love. And, and just, you know, LeBron's okay being a facilitator. But between those two guys, they get they got some things to work out with. At the end of the game, kind of like, you know, LeBron and D. Wade a few years ago in Miami, there's, there's some similarities there, but yeah, you're right with Kyrie. That's not that's going to take some time to iron out the issues between LeBron, Love, and Irving. See, I I think if there's if there was a player at the upper echelon or you know at the top of the roster that could be moved. You know, I, I know there's already some rumors about Kevin Love, like he, you know, he could jump ship in the summer, and you know that's whatever. I mean, ultimately he he gets to be a free agent, so he can make whatever choice he wants. I have a feeling he'll stay with LeBron James. Seems like the best move, but uh, I think there, if there was a player to move on this roster, it would be Kyrie, because ultimately, you know, what's the value of, of trading away Deion Waiters? I think in a lot of ways, the best value for Deion Waiters is to keep him as a junior Dwayne Wade and let LeBron mold him into something of value. I don't think Kyrie Irving is going to change his entire approach to the game of basketball to work for LeBron James. I think there might just be uh, a conflict there. Um, I don't I I don't want to I don't want to be melodramatic. I just think ultimately like you just said, Kyrie's going to be the player he wants to be, and if that doesn't work next to LeBron James, I'm sure there's a team that would help Cleveland out at the center position or something uh, right. to make it worth their while. I, I, I would be really interested to know what kind of offers they would get. You know, Does Kyrie Irving net Cleveland multiple first-round picks and a big man? You know, you know, Could they turn Kyrie into a pass-first point guard? Uh but, I mean, ultimately, it's also going to be really fun to watch them work it out, and I have a feeling that LeBron, Love, and, and Kyrie, at a certain point, are going to click, and they're going to score a lot of points all the time. Yeah, they'll get the issues, they'll get the issues ironed out. I'm not, I'm not saying they're going to win a title this year. I think they're a year away from, you know, probably winning a title, maybe two, but um, they'll get it worked out. And and back to Toronto, I think they're they're a – they're a trade away from being a team that can actually threaten Cleveland. Um, I don't know who that trade piece would be. Maybe another, maybe another wing player to go along with, you know, that backcourt of Lowry and DeRozan, but they're, they're just one. I, I can't put my finger on it. There's one piece they're missing for being an actual title contender. They don't have it yet. And I don't know who it would be. I don't know if you have any idea well, as to who that could be, but well, on the BS report this week, Zach and and Bill were talking about that, and they came up with Al Horford. I think Al Horford gets thrown into trade rumors far too often. I really don't think Atlanta's interested in getting rid of him because he's kind of he's kind of the perfect Tim Duncan 
uh, clone for what Budenholzer is trying to do there. Uh, so yes. I don't think he's I don't think he's going to get moved. I think the player is David West because I think David West is too good and, and could mean a lot more to a contender this year than you know he means to Indiana on a team that's going to lose fifty five games. I think I think David West is going to get traded to a contender at some point, and if I'm Toronto, you know you could. You could slide David West into a bunch of roles. He could he could be your starter. You could bring Amir Johnson and, and Patterson off the bench. You could bring West off the bench and have him work against second units. And I, I and his tenacity and his playoff experience alone uh, could really step that team up. Uh, and I, I I just would want to see it because I like I like David West a lot. I I think he he's the kind of player who could come in and say hey. I'm yours. I'm going to buy into whatever this team is doing. I just got here. What's my role? And he battles LeBron hard. He battles the Bulls hard. It would be fun. Ideally, I think the the best place for David West would be Charlotte, even though I don't know how that whole thing with Lance Stevenson would work out with them being teammates again. But (laughs) that would actually be the place. That would actually be the place that makes the most sense because they, they need somebody else before I can take them seriously because I don't, I don't know if, if Wes brings the offensive skill set that they need because they, they need some offense. They it may, it may be a wing player, a shooter for them because they just they can't shoot right now. But I, I felt like Horford or Wes would be a good a good trade possibility for Charlotte if they wanted to seriously contend this year. But yeah, Wes Wes needs to go somewhere. I don't. It's a shame to see him play out the end of his career on a team on an Indiana team that is just awful yeah that's the tough part with Indiana is they're only going to be this bad one more time I mean Paul George is going to come back and if you have Frank Vogel and Paul George and Roy Hibbert especially in the east that's a playoff team so it's really just a one-year hiccup but like David West is already in his mid-30s he's a player that wants to be a part of something now uh and I think he just he just has more value as uh, a trade piece to a team that could use a power forward like him. Uh, and I think Indiana is smart. Uh, they're smart enough to realize this is their chance to bottom out one time, get a, get a lottery talent to pair up with Paul George and Roy Hibbert, and you know see if they can't grab an extra draft pick through a guy like West or a guy like George Hill, that kind of thing. So uh, I, I'm just, I mean, just talking about it for half an hour with you, it's so good to have the NBA back and 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 watching it every night. There's there's obviously an endless amount of things to talk about. Uh, but Cole, we've we've run our course with this one, man. We you know ran a little long. Uh, we got to get you on again soon. Uh, can't wait to read uh, your work the rest of this week and uh, go uh, go Tigers, right? That's right. War, War Eagle this weekend. I appreciate it, man. We'll talk soon. All right, talk to you.